Hi everyone. It's a beautiful day, so I thought I'd come out here to the park and record a video uh, to share a few thoughts on a recent podcast from uh, Doomed Productions that I listened to yesterday and gave me a lot to think about. It was talking about the future of independent film and the role that YouTube might play in that. I think specifically in terms of preserving uh, films and getting films out there in the future. I wanted to start with a really interesting question that was posed in this uh, discussion and it was whether or not there has been a filmmaker who worked you know, more or less in total obscurity whose films, uh, you know, in, in total obscurity, isolation, maybe even unbeknownst to any, that any, uh, by anybody else that they were even making films, and then has gone on to be rediscovered and championed and acclaimed after, you know, maybe after their death, you know, as their films have been rediscovered. And I was giving this a lot of thought. And I couldn't, I, I, you know, they gave the example of somebody like Emily Dickinson, you know, writing poetry entirely for herself, uh, uh, never intended to be shared publicly, and then, uh, you know, basically being put in a drawer and discovered years later, and, and of course seeing her uh, reputation, you know, really be established off of that. And I was trying to think if there is a parallel that I could think of in the film world. And I don't, I, I couldn't really come up with one, uh, at least to that degree. Uh, and I'll say why I think that is in a minute, but I, you know, I was thinking of some of the, like, the closest analogies that I could think of. And first my mind went to thinking about some of like, the, the B-movie genre filmmakers uh, from the 40s who, whose careers were kind of resuscitated and uh, whose re or reputations, I guess, were, rather, were, were resuscitated by film critics you know, decades later who went back and looked at these films and saw something kind of special there. And I thought, but that's not really that's not really a good analogy because their films were, of course, commercially released. They were they were known. I mean, they may not have been especially famous, but they were known. And then I th started thinking about well, probably the closest analogy would be something like the amateur cinema movement and some of the figures that emerged from that, and even the um, early American avant-garde cinema, like pre Maya Deren. I think some of those filmmakers worked you know, pretty much in obscurity for, for most of their lives. And then it's only really been through recent study revisiting those films and kind of looking through the archives. It's, again, certain figures have emerged as being significant. Um, within the field of studying home movies, for example, somebody like Robbins Barstow, uh, who was an amateur filmmaker, made uh, films of his travels around the world, and uh, throughout the 1960s and 70s and 80s. And it really wasn't until the mid-2000s, he, and I believe it was his son, started uploading the films to the Internet Archive so that they could be shared and seen. And a home movie that he'd made back in 1956 called Disneyland Dream actually ended up getting named to the National Film Registry of the Library of Congress as a film that was historically significant. Uh, so I think there have been cases of people who if it hadn't been for the internet, especially um, making you know helping to get their films out there, would have been extremely obscure, and probably not uh, discussed too much out of the cir you know kind of the circles that they shared their films with on their own. But as far as somebody who is you know working in complete obscurity, and uh, has been hailed as like a master of cinema if you will, um, after their death or whatever, that's, that's a lot harder for me to think of an exact uh, analogy. Um, now, part of the reason why I think it's very difficult to think of anybody like that in film is that because traditionally film has been such an ambitious and expensive undertaking that it's, it's unlikely, I think, that for a lot of people that they would have made films entirely for themselves and then just, you know, put them away in a drawer, uh, so to speak, or put, put the film reels away in the closet and forgotten about them. Um, of course, it's possible that that's happened and we just haven't discovered that person yet. But uh, I, I think there's something about the cost the, uh, and, and the, just the time and effort that it has traditionally taken to make a film that has worked against that kind of um, uh, obscurity. But 
one of the, so I, I don't think there's I don't think there is necessarily an exact parallel, but probably the closest I can think of would be something in the, in the amateur cinema world or the early American avant-garde um, uh, movement. But then there's this question of what role does YouTube play in all of this, and I think it's probably beyond just YouTube, but more broadly about you know sharing films, making them available online, and uh, and you made a really good point in the in the podcast talking about the fact that YouTube as a platform is probably safe in the sense that it's not going anywhere. Uh, it, it's kind of hard to imagine YouTube. Um, going away anytime you know anytime real soon so i think it's likely that films that have been uploaded to youtube uh, will continue to be available for a really long time and this gets into something that i've been i've been kind of going back and forth with a filmmaker that i know uh I expressing a little little bit of uh bewilderment over something that he has a tendency, he's been publishing his films online for you know, probably 15 years, uh, including YouTube, but has a tendency of uh, uploading them and then after it could be a few months or a year or whatever, pulling them back down again. And I keep trying to discourage that because to me, the problem with that is that um, it works against the, the discovery of, of the films. You know, I think sometimes especially in uh, just the nature of the uh, internet and social media that we, we expect like that instant gratification that if we publish a movie online it's instantly going to get you know a hundred hits right away whatever you know whatever number you're expecting but um, to me the the, the, the real uh, the special thing about YouTube and you know uploading the films to the web is not actually what happens right away but it's exactly what um, you know what what the guys from Doom Productions were talking about in this podcast which is that it there's a potential for it to be discovered years later and i don't just mean 2 or 3 years later i mean you know 10 15 20 years i mean think about this that youtube is already what 16 years old and you know it's it's going to be really fascinating in another decade or two assuming it is still around in its current form that you know the videos that are are, are still there it's going to be really interesting to see what what kind of films start to maybe get some more attention? Um, so to me, that that's that's the thing about putting your films online is that it's best to it's best to leave them up. I mean, when I put up a video now, I do it with the intention that it's always going to be up online, and as long as the platform exists, you know, assuming you know the servers don't get wiped or the website doesn't get pulled down or whatever, you know, my intention is that the videos will live out there. Uh, hopefully long after I'm gone, you know, I mean, you know, hopefully decades and decades uh, at least and that they will be available, um, you know, precisely uh, for anybody who might be interested in them. You know, I think that's one of the great things about um, about making films available online is that if the platform uh, is still around, then, then the films can still be out there. Accessibility, you know, that's one of the biggest, I think that, that really is the key question here, isn't it, about accessibility and uh, just, just having access to these films to be able to see what people are doing and to, uh, to, to be able to discover what they're doing. I mean, think about how many films over the years have been lost. I mean, it's, you know, it's a tremendous amount, it's a significant percentage of films are estimated to be lost for good. and. And that's going to especially affect movies where maybe only a single print existed, you know, like a, like a, uh, an early avant-garde film, perhaps, or, you know, certain home movies. I mean, imagine, imagine the uh, possibility of the film reels being discovered after somebody passes away and then the, the family just doesn't know what to do with them and junks them. You know, then those films are gone. Those would have been the only, the only prints. So th that is one thing I think that... Um, you know, YouTube and, and other platforms, especially like the Internet Archive. I, I think, by the way, uh, that's 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 a platform that I, I would strongly encourage you know people to think about in relation to this question, because the the whole point of the Internet Archive is to make things uh, you know available on a more or less permanent basis and make them accessible. But uh, 
yeah, that's where I think that the, the kind of the, the real beauty of these platforms comes in is that not only does it make the film available to a worldwide audience, but it's storing a copy uh, that even if the original you know copy is uh, lost or destroyed or ac otherwise accidentally deleted or whatever, uh, it's you know there is still a copy out there. And in that sense, I do think that something like what you're describing with an Emily Dickinson and the idea of a filmmaker having his or her work discovered, you know, years, uh, maybe even, de you know, decades after their, their, their passing or late in life or whatever. Um, I think it's actually becoming a lot more possible, uh, a, lot, a lot easier to imagine something like that happening. Uh, also, of course, because with the rise of digital video, I mean, this kind of goes without saying, I guess, but, you know, with the rise of digital video, it's just also so much more, uh, it, it, it's, it's so much easier for filmmakers to make something entirely personal, entirely for themselves. I mean, think about all the vlogs that are out there, you know, think about all those vlogs that are out there that have been uploaded. I mean, some have been up for over a decade already at this point. I bet there's a lot of cases where people uploaded them, you know, while they were while they were involved in that and, and creating vlogs, and I bet they've probably forgotten that they were even out there, you know. So those are those are preserved out there on YouTube as long as, uh, again, as long as you know servers don't get wiped or you know th the, the site doesn't shut down, they're they're out there, and that's that to me is a great thing about it because somebody can come along all the you know years later, and uh, and discover it. But uh, I think the role of digital technologies both in terms of you know production and also as a as a um, way of putting the films out into the world through uh, YouTube is definitely going to have a major impact on the possibility of um, you know scenario like that you describe where uh, somebody who's entirely unknown working in total obscurity ends up having their work uh, discovered and and even having their reputation kind of championed off of that. Definitely think that's possible. You know, there's an interesting thing uh, I recently became aware of. It just kind of, you know, reminded me of this. This uh, I, there's, there's a song out there. It's called The Most Mysterious Song on the Internet. And there's a, there's a whole story behind it. I won't get into it here, but uh, you can look this up. It's basically a song that was recorded off of the radio in uh, Germany back in the early 80s. And... Uh, the person who recorded it, who taped it off the radio, wasn't able to identify it, and it's been it's been uploaded to you know, it's all over YouTube now and everything, and people are trying to identify the song and the artist, and no one seems to be able to come up with anything. And this is a good example of a piece of media, in this case, a, a you know music recording that has uh, found this whole you know second life online. I mean, if it, it imagine if it had only gone out over the air on the radio once almost 40 years ago and hadn't been taped, you know, it would be, it would just kind of be lost into the ether now and no one would even be thinking of it. But because somebody taped it, held onto the tape, and then it was digitized and put online and now there's this whole, kind of this whole mystery about it, uh, it it's kind of taken on a life of its own. And I, I could imagine, I mean, maybe not something exactly like that happening, but I could kind of imagine, um, you know something similar happening with a film that you know maybe somebody finds it on YouTube maybe it only has you know a few a few views or whatever maybe it was uploaded years and years and years ago and it starts to kind of take on a life of its own as people get ex you know watch it get excited about it share it but they don't know anything really about who made it or anything like that you know i could i could imagine something like that happening um, it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, because there really isn't like a, a real strong parallel to that anywhere in the film world. Uh, again, I think it's just the, the um, traditionally the expense and the effort that had to go into making any film kind of worked against that. Um, but, you know, like I said, there, there's probably as in the last uh, couple of decades as... You know, the field of film history has really tried to, I think, spread into some uh, areas that previously may not have may not have uh, been taken real seriously or given a lot of attention, like home movies and things like that. I think you're starting to see the um, 
you're starting to see more of that kind of thing emerge. But uh, yeah, it's really, really interesting. I think there is something very appealing too, as a filmmaker, about the idea of you know the work living on, you know, being being discovered maybe years later, and you know, find, really connecting with people or whatever. I think that's probably a, a natural desire. Uh, that when you're when you're creating any any creative work, that you hope that it kind of takes on a life of its own, and um, you know, so I I agree. You know, YouTube and and online uh, platforms like that will, will certainly play a big part in it. Anyway, I guess that's it. I uh, you know pretty much just uh, wanted to put a few 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 of my own thoughts out there in response to this because, like I said, the uh, podcast gave me a lot to think about really an interesting topic and um, you know good to hear these 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 ideas being discussed out there I think there there's a lot of value to thinking about it anyway um, thanks for watching and I will talk to you later